Welcome to the 70th annual, not annual, the 70th Perkins Lecture Series. It is a joy to welcome each of you to First United Methodist Church of Wichita Falls this evening. We, those of you that heard uh, Pastor Amy this morning, I know that you're anxious to hear her again. She was amazing. If you missed that, you can catch that on the website. Uh, she brought us a wonderful, thought-provoking message this morning, and I look forward to this lecture and the two lectures tomorrow. Thank each of you again for joining us. I want to invite you also to a mission project that we have going on tomorrow between the two lectures. It will be from 3 to 5 in the basement in Rec Lobby. We'll be putting together meals for Stop Hunger Now, and those meals will be used for hunger relief. So if you want to come, it's come and go. You don't have to be there the whole time. Come any time between 3 and 5 uh, and follow the signs. Finally, tonight is the last opportunity you have to sign up for a free dinner that we have tomorrow. We want to make sure that we buy enough food to feed everyone, but everyone is welcome to come and join us for dinner tomorrow at 5.30. You just have to let us know. So please uh, join me now in singing hymn number 127, Guide Me, O Thy Great Jehovah. Our first scripture reading this evening comes from the book of Exodus, the 16th chapter, verses 1 through 3, and we heed this reading from the Word of God. The whole congregation of the Israelites set out from Elim, and Israel came to the wilderness of Sin, which is in between Elim and Sinai. On the 15th day of the second month, after they had departed from the land of Egypt, the whole congregation of the Israelites complained against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. The Israelites said to them, if only we had died by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt when we sat by the flesh pots and ate our fill of bread. For you have brought us out into this wilderness to kill this whole assembly with hunger. May we hear now the reading from the Gospel of Matthew, the 26th chapter, verses 36 through 45. Then Jesus went with him to a place called Gethsemane, and he said to his disciples, Sit here while I go over there and pray. He took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee and began to be grieved and agitated. Then he said to them, 
I am deeply grieved, even to death. Remain here and stay awake with me. And going a little farther, he threw himself on the ground and prayed, My father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Yet not what I want, but what you want. Then he came to the disciples and found them sleeping. And he said to Peter, So, you could not stay awake with me one hour. Stay awake and pray that you may not come into the time of trial. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Again, he went away for the second time and prayed, My father, if this cannot pass unless I drink it, your will be done. Again, he came and found them sleeping, for their eyes were heavy. So leaving them again, he went away and prayed for the third time, saying the same words. And he came to the disciples and said to them, Are you still sleeping and taking your rest? See, the hour is at hand and the Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. May God bless this reading of the word to our understanding, and to God's name be praised. May we pray. Almighty and ever-living God, in whom we live and move and have our being. You created us for yourself, and our hearts are restless until they find rest in you. You knit us together in our mother's wombs. When we come to the end, we are still with you. O oh, almighty and loving God, we are so mindful that in this life so filled with joys and pleasures, things for which we offer you the deepest praise, blessings beyond number, yet still there will be times of the deepest trouble and the most grievous sorrow, and sometimes it will seem if there is no end to those days. And so we pray that you will help us to trust when we do not understand, that you will give to those who are ill in body, mind, or spirit the healing that is needful, that you will grant to the dying peace and a holy death, that you will give to those who mourn the peace that passes understanding, that you'll reassure to all of those who are beset with anxiety and fear that your will for them is not despair, but faith, not doubt, but hope, not hatred, but love, not death, but life. Bless your servant, Amy, we pray, as she brings your word and make us, each of us, according to your desire, your faithful servant. And give us grace and give us courage until at last our final prayer is, not our will, but thine be done. In Jesus' name, amen.
It's an honor and a privilege to introduce this year's Perkins Lecturer, the Reverend Dr. Amy Butler. Dr. Butler currently serves as the Senior Minister of the Riverside Church in New York City, being both the youngest and the first female senior minister in that church's storied history. By my count, she is also the fourth of Riverside's pastors to be the Perkins Lecturer. Amy Butler is what I call a cradle Christian in that she was raised in a devout Christian family. She grew up in the diverse community that is Hawaii and from a young age was very active in her church. After high school, Pastor Amy attended Baylor University in Waco where she received both a BA and an MA in church history. Unfortunately, she also experienced firsthand what it means to be excluded from the church you love as one called by God to ministry. However, just before she left for seminary in Europe, she was licensed to gospel ministry at the Lakeshore Baptist Church in Waco, which was the first community of faith to affirm her call to ministry. She received a Bachelor of Theology from the International Baptist Seminary, and later her Doctor of Ministry from Wesley Theological Seminary, a United Methodist Seminary in Washington, D.C. Dr. Butler's first professional experience of ministry was directing a shelter for homeless women in New Orleans, followed by serving on the staff of St. Charles Avenue Baptist Church in New Orleans, and then serving as the senior pastor at Calvary Baptist Church in Washington, D.C., before being called to Riverside. Amy is the mother of three young adult children, Hayden, Hannah, and Sam. Pastor Amy, we're delighted to welcome you to Wichita Falls, and we hear you gladly. Thank you so much for coming out tonight on a Sunday night. It's so great to see your faces and be with you again. I asked the sound and light team to turn the lights down and just keep the spotlight here so you could see the halo around me in the back here. Okay. You know, I'm of the opinion that one of the biggest misrepresentations in all of modern publishing is the book, What to Expect When You're Expecting. If you have somehow acquired an infant in, say, the past 30 years, you will be familiar with this book, with, which is, some would say, the Bible of parenting. When I was expecting my first child, naturally the first thing I did was get a copy. Maybe I had two, I can't remember. That was over 20 years ago. And I read it religiously. And by religiously, I mean more than my Bible way more than my Bible. I kept a copy on my bedside table and I consulted it constantly, every day, several times a day. Actually, I would pick it up eager to see what important developmental step my future child had achieved. Today, eyelashes. Tomorrow, fingernails. I knew he was an overachiever from the very beginning. This frantic consultation of what to expect continued through the first few years of this first child's life, and I read every sequel of the, to the very last word of what to expect the toddler years. And then the books ran out. I felt fairly betrayed by these books I had lived by for so long, but I did okay at the whole parenting thing without a book, I think until my eldest reached about, I think, age 11, maybe it was 12. The change happened on whatever day it was that I walked into the living room, mentioned a thought I'd had offhand, and was met not with friendly banter, but with a deep, soul-wrenching sigh of disgust, accompanied by a very dramatic rolling of the eyes. Teenagers. You gotta love them, they keep you humble. But there is no what to expect book for teenagers, none. As I'd entered the adventure of parenting, I'd been under the impression 
since there were all these books to answer all the questions, that infanthood was the hardest part of the parenting task. Apparently not. Since that revelation, I've done some more reflection on just why it is that there is no what to expect for teenagers. And I think I know. They can't write a book about it because nobody knows what to expect. <laughs> for example, it seems from my perspective that perfectly reasonable things are coming out of my mouth. Things like, maybe if you did your homework before watching five hours of television, you wouldn't be so stressed out at 11 p.m. Or curfew was 10, you came home at 10.15, which means you chose these consequences. These perfectly reasonable expressions seem offensive, incomprehensible to my teenagers some days. Some time ago, however, in the frustration and inability to communicate, my then 16-year-old daughter and I reached a stasis, a ground of common understanding. It happened one day when, in frustration, I blurted out, you know, it's not like I don't understand. I was a 16-year-old girl once myself. The shock that crossed my daughter Hannah's face <laughs> when I said those words Encouraged, I went on. I know, for example, the urgency to attend high school football games has nothing to do with the game of football. And I know, right here in my gut, why the mall is one of the most sacred places in the entire world. I know these things because as hard as it may be to believe, I was once a 16-year-old girl. It was this beautiful moment, you know, Hannah and I really getting each other. But then Hannah's eyes fell. I know you were 16, she said, but you cannot possibly understand my biggest problem. What's that, I said. She answered in true dismay, Mom, you have no idea how hard it is not to have an iPhone. You know, in that moment, I had to admit she was right. She was absolutely right. Times have changed. I have no idea how hard it is to be a 16-year-old girl without an iPhone. Parenting uncertainty reared its ugly head again, and how I wish I had a book to consult on these matters. As I mentioned this morning, and as you heard, I've recently taken a new job in which I've moved from a small, healthy, diverse congregation in what I now know to be the soft and slow-paced city of Washington, D.C. <laughs> Everything is relative. To a very large congregation that has suffered a five and a half years of leadership transition, carries the weight of considerable history and witness, and is located in the relentlessly high-paced city of New York. So basically, I've been looking for a book called What to Expect When Everybody Expects Everything. <laughs> I haven't found that one yet either. Change is hard, isn't it? It doesn't really matter what kind of change it is. And I have observed over these years of my journey of church leadership that along with all the personal change that comes in every single one of our individual lives, whether we want it or not, the institutional church in America is changing. Maybe you're not feeling the change in the same way that I'm feeling it, but it is an indisputable overall trend. The institutional church in America is in decline. Church as you and I know it is slipping away, and for some of us faster than others, but it is slipping away nonetheless. I'm just going to name it. It's happening. And for those of us who do church as a vocation, for those of us who belong to and invest in church communities, these are scary times. We're all wondering, whether aloud or internally, how do we nurture, guide, become beloved community in the way of Jesus when the very way we've known to do this our whole lives is changing so quickly? Some of you may remember back in 2010, a story that got a lot of press attention. It was when well-known novelist Anne Rice posted a status update on her Facebook page. Today, I quit being a Christian. 
I'm out. I remain committed to Christ as always, but not to being Christian or to being part of Christianity. Diana Butler Bass, a writer and theologian who studies modern Christianity, talks about that Facebook update in her recent book, Christianity After Religion. It's an example, Butler Bass says, of what's going on all over the country these days. People are ditching institutional religion in droves. And I'm not making this up. A Gallup survey from 2012 indicates that in 1973, 68% of Americans said that they had confidence in organized religion. In 2012, that number had dipped to 44%. And the Pew Forum on Religion and Public Life reported a study indicating that in 2007, 15% of Americans described themselves as religiously unaffiliated. 2012, that's five years later, the percentage had jumped to 19%. And in a survey of all those who say they've left the church, 71% say it was because they just drifted away. Religion just isn't compelling or important to them anymore. Even if you are not feeling this shift quite yet, at the risk of being a voice of doom and gloom, I'll have to say, it's coming. And sociologist of religion Mark Chavez from Duke University writes, the evidence for decades-long decline in American religiosity is now incontrovertible, like the evidence for global warming. It comes from multiple sources, it shows up in several dimensions, and it paints a consistent factual picture. The burden of proof has shifted to those who want to claim that religion in America is not declining. Why? Why would people ever think to want to leave the blue-haired old ladies and that special smell of the fellowship hall? You know, that comforting combination of floor wax and casseroles? Well, like Anne Rice, some of us are mad at the church. Mad at the church for its unwillingness to take stands on controversial issues. Others, just bored. They think the church has nothing of value to add to the modern conversation of human life. There's a growing group of us who call ourselves the nuns and answer on surveys none when polled for religious preference no longer feel the need to participate in organized religion, so they've declared a whole new category of religious association because who really needs religion? They're so far away from any meaningful experience of organized faith that they've come to associate what you and I do on Sunday mornings with our friends from Westboro Baptist Church whom we see on television picketing funerals in the name of Jesus, all the while carrying horrible and hateful signs. We can see this trend very clearly up in the big city. The cultural pressure and expectation that fueled regular church attendance 50 years ago, just 50 years ago, doesn't exist anymore. In other words, you can be a very good and nice person and not go to church. And you can go to brunch on Sunday morning. And you can linger over your coffee. And you can read the New York Times Sunday edition as the morning sun puddles around your couch. Not that I'm bitter or anything. <laughs> you can do all these things and you can still be a moral, kind, good person. So you might call yourself a nun, or my personal favorite category, spiritual but not religious, which you will find on any dating site. In fact, I would say it's becoming such a norm that the strained ones are those of us who do go to church, and even for those who claim a religious affiliation, you know as well as I do, modern life pulls us away. Travel, Sunday morning, kids' sports, the need for just one day a week to sleep in decline. It's happening all over the pews and in increasing cases 
the pews are going away too. If you were looking for a romantic place to have dinner in Houston, for example, you could try Mark's American Cuisine. Mark's is located in a 1920s renovated church building. The, web, the website reads, the golden ceilings, hand-painted deco walls, and candle-lit tables provide guests with an intimate escape from the outside world. A congregation that could not sustain its building had to sell it to become a restaurant. And Marx is not the only church turned restaurant, condo, nightclub. This is happening all over the country these days. Dwindling numbers and congregations can't maintain their huge buildings, and they just can't keep church going as we could at its height. Everything is changing, and it's changing fast. So I wonder if you're asking the same question I'm asking. Where does this leave us? Those of us who work so hard to bring life to the institutional church, who show up for organized worship and maintain old buildings, those of us who bake the casseroles and wax the floors for the fellowship hall, those who struggle to make the church relevant, and if not relevant, then at least sustainable. I don't know about you, but these are some questions that keep me up at night, and they leave me feeling scared, uncertain, confused, looking around at the pieces of American institutionalized religion scattered all over the ground and wondering desperately, what is coming next for us? I thought I knew the way the transforming message of Jesus would unfold in this world. I was raised in the church. I studied in the academy for many years to learn how to lead the church. I love the church. But now it seems that everything that I love and know is changing. So what do we do? How do we nurture, guide, become beloved community in the way of Jesus when the very way we have known to do this all our lives looks so different from what we'd always thought? You know, the Israelites wanted a different future too. What they had going just wasn't sustainable. They were caught in brutal oppression, slavery in Egypt, and they wanted something better for their children, something vibrant and full of life. And after crying out to God for deliverance, all of a sudden they could see the way opening up in front of them, and they took it. They gathered all their things and uprooted their families and set out with vigor for an unknown future through the Red Sea, just out of the reach of the Egyptian army, they got to the shoreline on the other side and they wept with relief. They wept and cheered and sang, I will sing unto the Lord for he has triumphed gloriously, the horse and rider thrown into the sea. We made it. And then they turned around. They turned around and all they could see in front of them was a future that did not look anything like the past. Not at all. There was sand and desert as far as the eye could see. There was nothing comfortable and nothing familiar and nothing orderly and nothing safe. Change. And it wasn't too long after that that the comment box started overflowing. Now, I want to fill you in a little pastor secret. I imagine that this happens to every pastor, though I don't know for sure, but it certainly happens to me all the time. Here's how it goes down. A well-meaning church member, it could be someone who doesn't really like the pastor. Can you imagine that? <laughs> but very often, it's a positive, happy contributor to the community, goes on vacation. And this church member goes to visit her parents in Ohio or spend some time in the condo in Florida or take that tour of Napa Valley that they've been waiting to take forever. 
And while they are on this vacation, being dedicated church members, they go to church. They pick a little congregation nearby, or they research an innovative church in the city, or they go to hear their parents' pastor, who their parents have been saying for years is the best preacher in America. They go to visit these churches and they love them. They love their church experience so much that they want to share it with their pastor at home. And so they gather everything up that they can, the visitor cards in the pews that are way nicer than ours, the handouts for the children at Children's Church, the adult Bible school curriculum, and don't forget the bulletin. Then after worship at the back door, they talk to the pastor and they get his card, plus his promise that he'll be glad to talk to their pastor at home, you know, just to give her some hints on how to preach better and all. And then they come back from vacation to their home church where you are the pastor and they give you a big packet full of all this information and very often it has notes all over it. This was the best part of the worship service. We should really do this. Notes from the preacher's sermon, the source for the art on the front of the bulletin. And all of this is meant usually to be helpful and supportive to offer new ideas and suggestions. Okay, here's the secret part. We pastors don't like that. <laughs> Acknowledging all of the good, usually, intention that goes into such a gift, we pastors hear this as complaint. And I'm pretty sure that's how Moses and Aaron felt when they got the people well into the desert, into the change they had asked for and wanted when they were so desperate for new life. But now the change they despise because it's unfamiliar and they can't see what's ahead and they're starting to wonder if things were really as bad as they would thought back in Egypt. Remember, if only we had died by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt when we sat by the flesh pots and ate our fill of bread. For you have brought us out into this wilderness to kill us, the whole assembly, with hunger. We just don't like change. Churches don't like change. Pastors don't like change. Nobody likes to change. But we know, don't we? As Jesus did when he brought his disciples into Gethsemane, that change is on the way. The disciples, they fell asleep. They weren't paying attention to the fact that living their faith, following in the way of Jesus, was going to turn their world on its head. But Jesus knew. And if you and I can manage to stay awake, well, we know too. If you feel like I do some days, panicky about what's ahead and longing for a familiar past, here's a bit of comfort. Even though he knew that change was inevitable and ultimately his commitment to God's way would not falter, Jesus even didn't want to go there. You heard him. If there is any way around this change ahead of me, I sure would appreciate it if you would let me know. Because I don't know what's ahead of me, but I'm pretty sure it's going to be painful. And I don't know what to expect. And we don't know what to expect when everything changes. You know, my daughter Hannah really rattled me when she threw that iPhone curveball into the conversation I mentioned earlier. Because she's right. I don't know what it's like to be a 16-year-old girl in the sorrow, sorrowful state of an iPhone-less life. I do not. But after I recovered from my parenting fumble, I patiently explained to Hannah, you might not know this about me, but I endured at age 16 the vast injustice of my mother, your grandmother, refusing 
flatly refusing to allow me to use my own allowance to buy a brand new pink slimline telephone with one of those curly stretchy cords, which, as I carefully explained to my mother, your grandmother, I could plug right into the wall in my room, stretch out on the bed, and talk to my friends for hours. A look of grudging admiration crossed Hannah's face then, and we became in that moment a team united in shared injustice. I was able in that moment to take a breath and to relax against my own experience. You know, maybe I could do this parenting thing without a book telling me what to expect. Because I know what it's like to be a 16-year-old girl. I just had to sit for a minute and remember. That's true for us, too. It's true for us as we, the church, stand here peering out into an unknown future of this institution that we love. We're all looking at the change ahead from different vantage points. Some of us are a bit like the Israelites, just whining about the change overall. Some of us are more like the disciples, asleep at the wheel with everybody around us kicking us to make us pay attention. And some of us are there, right there next to Jesus, bracing for a future about which we know nothing except this is scary and I don't know what to expect. And I bet whatever it is, is going to hurt. Or maybe like me, you're all over the map in one or more of those positions every single day. Tonight, listen, friends, this is the truth. You and I don't know the future of the church. We don't know what the future will hold in this moment when everything for this institution is changing. But we should be able to just take a moment and relax against our own experience. We don't need a what to expect book, friends, because here's what we know. We know, you and I know in the very core of who we are, how to be the beloved community, that beautiful, beautiful blueprint of God's imagination that I spoke of this morning. We know how God transforms us and transforms our world through healthy relationship, through prophetic collaboration, through corporate worship and shared mission. We know how to live and to love in the way of Jesus. We know how to be the beloved community. And friends, we can do that. We can do it. We can do it together, even when everything changes. Amen. I ask that you stand as you are able and join in singing hymn number 453, More Love to Thee, O Christ.
thank you once again for joining us this evening for uh, the second of our lectures, and we hope that you will, as you are able, come and join us again tomorrow. Our lectures are at 11 and at 7 p.m., so see if you can sneak out from work a little bit early and come and join us for our next lecture at 11. Thank you all for coming to be a part of this amazing series, and I ask that you receive this benediction with your eyes open. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. Amen.